Sorry for the delay. I'd like to now call uh, the special meeting of the Board of Trustees to order um, at one. And, uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Hathaway? Present. Palmer? Present. Lintoff? Present. Rizzo? Absent. Terry? Absent. Noel? Absent. Riser? Present. We have four. All right. Our agenda is very simple. It's a presentation uh, followed by discussion. Um, there are a motion to uh, approve the agenda. So moved. Moved by Riser. Support by Palmer. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Agenda is adopted. Um, time for public comment. Is there anyone who would like to comment before we proceed with the uh, presentation? Um, so my questions. What's your name then actually? Because I thought about this after yesterday. I was looking through your slideshow presentation that's attached to this meeting as well as yesterday. Um, I guess I had a question surrounding you guys are able to do the renovation costs or I guess the demo costs that we were talking about for the brownfield without SILO being a core community, correct? Okay. I just didn't know that. I looked at the Finn slideshow and kind of yeah. made it seem like that, but it also did specifically say it. So uh, overall, I think whoever did the work on the uh, template for the RTA or whatever the actual tax payment is called did a pretty good job. Um, I think it's rather lengthy. It does a good job of evaluating the opportunity is. Um, I'd just like to see that's just a little bit further. So that's Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Um, yes, we have a Zoom hand. Uh, first up is Jonathan Greenberg. Jonathan? Hey, real quick. I just wanted to um, voice support uh, for Mark. I've, I've known Mark for about 30 years, and um, he's always been a good neighbor. I've watched his businesses grow. He's done a lot of good for Sio Township. I'm here in support. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Next up is Rob Pattinson. Rob? <laughs> Thank you, Rob. I see no other interested public. Will? All right. Let's proceed then with uh, presentation. Oh, actually, we have approval of minutes, but we don't have any minutes. Correct. Okay. So um, let's proceed with the presentation. Um, and I believe, Jennifer, you are the lead, and I will let each of you introduce yourselves uh, rather than myself. Oh, I'm, just to the left. <laughs> oh, okay. um, I'm Jennifer Olmstead. I'm from Ann Arbor Spark, the Economic Development Organization for Washtenaw County. I presented um, at the DDA meeting um, yesterday and a month before. Um, we get funding from SIO to be your economic development organization focused on business attraction and business retention. And I've worked with Mark um, for five years, helping to get a couple companies into um, MIHQ and actually was the lucky person who picked up the phone when a company called me from San Francisco looking to locate here. And um, I think they're going to be one of the tenants at this building. I'm Mark Smith from IHQ. Uh, not much more to say. I'm Brett Stantz. I'm with SME. And we're the Brownfield consultant on the project, also environmental consultant. And do a lot of community economic development work as well. And then we have a remote participant as well. 
Yes, hi, uh, Nathan Vogt with Washtenaw County Brownfield Authority. Wish I could be there in person, I'm sorry. Um, and just here to talk a little bit about our Brownfield program and how we can help the township uh, perhaps make this project a reality. Thank you. Um, see, like Mark, are you first up? I am. So Jennifer's going to run my slides so I can see my notes here. I, I'm a little rusty here because we, we pulled more together from yesterday as a result of yesterday's meeting. Uh, but good evening. Thanks for having this uh, special session for us. Uh, I'm Mark Smith with MyHQ, a tech accelerator incubator located on Wagner Road in an obsolete industrial complex. Uh, the old Gelman Sciences. Next slide. Um, MyHQ is a community-based co-working uh, business incubator. Since inception, we've helped way more than 80 companies now. Uh, the vast majority of them are early stage or pure startups. Most of these companies have grown into profitable entities and continue to expand. Um, our expansion plans include Z Road, 300 North Z Road. That's why we're here. Uh, it's going to be a big project, a costly project. Uh, we need to expand to accommodate the growth of the companies in our core campus and to accommodate new companies that would like to locate in the area for collaboration. We propose to renovate the 300 North Zeeb, uh, former ProQuest building, which has been vacant now for more than 10 years, has become a blighted property in our township. Uh, it acts as a gateway to our, our township and county offices. It doesn't represent us well, uh, nor does it represent the quality and type of technology companies that reside here. Uh, we're here to ask for your support to utilize a Brownfield TIF and a PA 210 uh, building renovation uh, act. Uh, with, Drop that somewhere. Yeah. PA 210 <laughs> commercial rehab. Uh, you know, so our goal is to reinvigorate this site uh, and and create a much better looking front door, reutilizing the shell that's there. There's a lot of good phones in this building. Next slide. Um, so the site offers many good qualities. It's, it was designed by Alden B. Dow, uh, the original portion of the building, which was built in the 1960s. It has good bones and it's made of concrete and brick. So it's, it's withstood much of the weathering that's gone on, but we do need to give it attention soon or it's, it is gonna deteriorate rapidly. Um, unfortunately, some of the building materials used at the time of, of uh, construction contain hazardous materials. Some of the process that were performed up there also left VOCs and in in heavy metals, in heavy metal contamination. So we need to do significant abatement uh, before we can renovate the site. So our plans are to uh, do a complete renovation of the interior and a facelift on the exterior of the site. Uh, We'll be converting the, the site into a combination of office, R&D, and pilot manufacturing for the many tech companies that will host there. Um, this includes a, a complete abatement of the environmental hazards, new floor plan, interior, and partitions and uh, to create functional spaces. A facelift to the exterior of the building while trying to preserve the Dow design elements along the, especially the south and uh, southwest portions of the building. We'll plan to re-landscape the grounds, including a berm and vegetation screen along the north property line. Used uh, Use of uh, native grasses, reduction in impervious surface. We want to reduce the parking lot. We don't think we need 500 parking places anymore. Uh, better stormwater management and where possible energy harvesting and geothermal systems. Uh, We'll create a highly specialized space needed for needed by the types of companies we are incubating. Uh, well, this technology is expected to locate in, on North Z include energy storage, MEMS, manu, MEMS and wafer fab manufacturing, life science uh, processing and, and microfluidics, photovoltaics, polymer chemistry, and a battery testing lab, just to name a few. Um, and there you can see a rendering uh, of how we intend the building to look when we're, we're, we're done. So our, uh, it will take a substantial investment to make all this happen. We're anticipating a 12 to $15 million investment to clean and renovate the property. And we're here to ask for your help uh, to make the project viable through a tax abatement utilizing the Brownfield TIF and a PA 210 Building Renovation uh, Act program. As we work through the budget, we see more than $2 million or $2.4 million worth of expense that qualify under the aforementioned programs. Uh, 
Chelsea has recently completed a PA 210 approval and has has a clear set of assessment criteria and scoring method to consider such applications. When we compare 300 North Sea project against the Chelsea scoring criteria, this project would score in the 140 to 160 range, which is considered top marks. On the slide here, you can see some of the criteria they use for qualification. I know one of our discussions this evening is, is laying out a criteria for the township to consider these types of applications. I think Chelsea's done a great job of laying out criteria to assess the value of the project. Um, we are in the very high uh, range of all of their qualifying criteria. Um, so. You know, there are a lot of steps and information needed to consider this statement. Here's what we have done so far. We met with the DDA yesterday and have answered many of their questions and, and are working on working to answer the remaining questions. We've walked the township assessor and appraiser through the property to get their opinion of, of the current and future value. And Spark has been in touch with Chelsea to better understand the use of the PA 210 Commercial Renovation Act tool uh, and how it worked for them. We have met with Spark and gotten their support for the project. And we have also had two virtual meetings with the resident, our, our residential neighbors to the north and gotten their verbal support for the project. I, I think that's the majority of the people who participated in those meetings. I can't speak for everybody. Um, we're asking for your support in the Brownfield TIF and PA 210 abatements. Uh, because there are many steps this process has to go through, we're anxious to try to get your support early so that we can continue on to the county and state level for their needed approvals as well. And thank you, Dave. If there are any questions, or I'll let uh, Jennifer. So now we're going to go through the two tools, but we wanted to sort of present the project to you. And then I'm going to turn it over to Nathan, who is with the uh, Brownfield Authority. Nathan, give me one second. Okay. And I am trying to turn on my video and not able to do that for some reason. I'm not that camera shy. <laughs> Here, let me make you co-host, see if that helps. It says uh, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh, hmm. there we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Well, while she pulls that up, I can just begin to talk a little bit about our role here. Um, I'm, I staff the County Brownfield Authority. Uh, the township is a participating member, one of 23 local units in the, in the county that we work with. And our role is to help communities redevelop brownfield sites, just like this one. We have a very active program. We have 16 active projects. They're actively capturing TIF. Um, uh, our most recent uh, plan uh, in a new community was Pittsfield Township. We did our first plan with them in the last six months, and this would be our first one with SIO potentially. Um, we formed in 1999. Um, like I said, we're a regional authority, which is pretty unique. Uh, so our role is to facilitate the process and to, uh, I view the township as our client. Um, uh, we want to be good stewards of tax funds and we want to help the township uh, kind of carry out redevelopment of these tough sites. You want to go to the next slide? Um, our main tool is tax increment financing and that's a piece of what's proposed, uh, what Mark is proposing for this site. And that simply is uh, you take the current base value and that continues to be paid to all the taxing jurisdictions the project happens, uh, presumably raising the taxable value, and that increase is what we use, the taxes paid on that increase in value is what we use to reimburse um, uh, the developer for these extraordinary uh, brownfield costs. Next slide. And we have a lot of different incentives we use. We have grant programs um, uh, and uh, we help with environmental assessments. Uh, but like I said, TIF is the most uh, common. And in this case, if you look down under environmental uh, types of costs, and this is what the DDA member uh, was alluding to, uh, demolition, 
uh, certainly soil remediation, lead and asbestos mitigation. These are all environmental. Some of these are non-environmental as well. The asbestos lead does fall under non, but it's all approved in a plan, put in a plan where you know the costs and we have an estimate of the number of years it might take to reimburse those costs based on the projections of taxable value. And we're still trying to nail down a lot of those costs. And that's why uh, Mark met with the assessor. We wanna get that uh, projected taxable value really accurate so we can present a plan to you that um, is reasonable and is accurate. Next slide. Um, and so the, the process always starts with you. Um, if the township or any city were to not approve a plan, it doesn't go any further. And it's a completely discretionary um, action on your part. You can weigh the merits and decide if the project is worthy and you can proceed. Uh, so it would go to you uh, first for approval. And uh, if there's um, an interlocal agreement required with the DDA because they're first in line to capture increment, we would have to go to the DDA as well and get an interlocal agreement with them. Then it would go to the County Brownfield Authority, my authority of nine members, they would make a recommendation. And then finally would go for a public hearing and uh, adoption by the County Board of Commissioners. And like I said, if, if you don't, you know, we're not gonna, we're, we're gonna work with you. We're gonna defer to your judgment. If you approve the plan and the plan is reasonable, our job is to kind of carry it through to adoption. And then I work on the back end with your finance director, with the developer, approving the costs. And then as the taxes go up, I work with uh, uh, you all to capture the taxes and, and issue reimbursements uh, until those costs are paid off, actual costs that come in on the project. The last step here on the slide is the, the what's called a work plan. And that simply is the next step beyond the Brownfield plan that has to go to Eagle and MEDC. And what that does is secure the capture of school taxes. So the 18 mills of operating and the six mills of SET. Uh, and the beauty of Act 381 is that we can bring all of the taxing jurisdictions uh, to bear on uh, these uh, extraordinary costs that really uh, are an impediment to redevelopment of the property. Next slide. And so as uh, I think Jennifer mentioned, uh, a great example, uh, or maybe Mark did, uh, that we did recently, which was very similar, was in Chelsea. Uh, they approved a PA 210, which offers the upfront abatement of local taxes. Um, they did a brownfield TIF plan as well to capture uh, increment over several years to reimburse the developer. And they also got, um, in fact, an EGLE grant as well to make that project happen. So this is not unprecedented. We also did a similar project in Depot Town and Ypsilanti, the Thompson block. So it's not atypical that in, in challenging historic um, old buildings like this that we have to kind of look at a, a various options. Next slide. Well, so that's all I had. And like my, like I said, my role is to really assist the township and facilitate the process uh, and um, make it as, as smooth as possible for everybody. Are there any questions? Several, but I don't want to jump yeah. the gun. <laughs> do, do you want to wait? So I was going to explain the 210. Yeah, do you want to do, do that next? Why and then, that and then yeah, yeah, I just have three slides. Um, on the 10th. So um, I'm here representing Ann Arbor Spark. Um, we wrote a policy about 10 years ago, um, assisting communities on setting up policies for um, tax abatements. And I talked to Will like a couple a couple months ago. Um, and then as working with Mark, he was looking for ways to finance his building. And although the township has used an IFT, um, which is a one type of tax abatement, we really looked at this project and said, you are a better fit for the Commercial Rehab Act, which is PA 210. So the commercial rehabilitation exemption is a, is a property tax abatement, very similar to the IFT, um, except it um, similar, it allows for an abatement from one to 10 years that is up to the community to decide. Um, the, the thing that makes it different is that it's really focused on rehabbing the building and going to the owner. Um, 
The primarily focuses on rehabbing and it provides 100% local um, millage abatement on, on new investment versus the IFT, which is a 50% abatement. But the goal is to really encourage um, former industrial sites that are idle and in need of uh, commercial uh, revitalization. So there's criteria that's spelled out from the state, right, to establish this exemption. To qualify, you have to be a commercial property that's um, older than 15 years. You have to be, you know, in need of rehab and show an economic efficient condition. Um, the rehabilitation of the property has to increase commercial activity and they, you know, are looking to create jobs, retain employment. So similar to other tax abatements, again, it's up to the local government to determine the number of years um, for the abatement. And so the way um, the P10, um, PA210 works um, is that the owner or the community needs to establish a commercial rehab district, and that requires a public hearing. Um, and then it's up to the township to approve a district. Um, the township notifies the county who may reject the district establishment. After the district is created, then the property owner files an application for a re, um, commercial rehabilitation exemption. And then there is another public hearing, so two public hearings where um, to approve um, the actual um, exemption app application. And again, the criteria um, is up to the local, local government. And so we, um, Spark, as the Economic Development Organization, always recommends that we're in this together as, a, as Washtenaw County. So we always think all of our local municipalities should have similar abatements because the whole idea is you don't want someone say, saying that, oh, we're going to go to Pittsfield or we're going to you know, leave Ann Arbor. We want you guys to all have the same. So we're always advocating to use the same um, criteria. And so the criteria that we um, have proposed um, that we wrote up in this sort of draft application was you know, looking at job retention, the project location, how many jobs it could create, the length of the vacancy, and then, you know, other, other discretion. And as Mark had pointed out for this specific project, um, this, um, you know, fits all those and would score um, very well. And so this, this is sort of an example of um, a ranking system uh, that the township could use. And wow. On through that fast. So that's good. that that's it. That's the 210. So um we kind of the point of this work session was to sort of review the tools um that we've been looking at to, to rehab the, the building and I'm gonna stop talking. When you say could score very well, score very well on what? It would score well because okay, so if on you look what? at on what, what do you on these criteria. On the, SAP test? No, no, on score one. on the ranking system that we created. Sorry. So like we we're mean the county, the measure, who's the, the I'm sorry, the building, the 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 renovation project. If you wanted to, you know, your to the criteria that you would create, it would this project scored well on that criteria that we outlined in this sort of draft policy. And the criteria was is it in a DDA district? It, will it retain jobs? Will it create new jobs? So the we is Spark. No, the we would become the township. Yes. So you score well by your own rank? No, no, no. No, 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 sorry. This is a recommendation that we have for all of the townships okay. yeah. to use the same criteria because you don't want a company saying, oh, I want to rehab. I'm going to go to Chelsea because I can get a better deal in Chelsea versus getting in SIO or I'm, you know what I mean? So standardized and kind of industry or municipal government accepted rating question mark. Well, early, earlier, John, um, I, just to clarify, Mark was applying Chelsea's criteria to his project and saying that it oh, scores well on there, Chelsea's. I'll wait my turn. Okay. I just wanted to know what the scoring criteria, who sets it and where it's set for. Oh, we, um, we actually, we, oh. other communities have done their own. So this is from Chelsea and okay. Spark's point of view is just advocating in the policy document that I gave your DDA like three months ago to establish policies is like, it's good to use the same across the whole region. No, I, I'm wondering, Will, if I could, I think, I think what would help me, because this is a, 
It's a lot of information in a short amount of time. Yes. I want to be responsive. Mark. So, so Mark, help me understand what your shortfall is. So you, you've got, I mean, why do you need this money, right? As policymakers, that's really what we have to figure out. Is, is it worth eroding, you know, the taxes that we bring in um, in order to get this benefit? So I understand you've already bought the building and I see this project summary here. So can you talk to me sure. a little bit about that? So I, I met with the assessors today and, and one of the one of the large expenses we always have to consider is taxes. So you, I'm sure you see properties changing hands in Ann Arbor and a lot of them change hands without regard to what the taxes are going to become. We're running on razor thin margins here. We do a lot of highly specialized space, which costs a lot of money, which could inflate the value of the property where it has limited ap uh, application to other users. In other words, we could artificially inflate the property value to a point where property tax becomes overly burdensome and we can't be profitable. So we're looking to uh, one capture that that tax payment because we have to get the we have to spend a lot of money just to get the property to a point where we can start to spend money to make it the way we need it. Um, so we've run our models based on where the taxes are today, where they would likely go with with um, some abatement. And then I, I honestly can tell you that we would be underwater if we went to the full valuation. And I know that's not how the formula works as to what our investment or acquisition investment and future value might be. So, oh, sorry. So just one more no, yeah, the, the tax, the, the tax abatement, when would that happen? And maybe it's more of a question for Andrea. When, when Mark says that would happen first, I know it has to get approved by the state tax commission after the county says it's okay and after the board. And it probably wouldn't go into effect until next year, 24, because it, as of December 31st. October 31st is the cutoff date okay. for an approval through the state tax commission. You're, for any. you're kind of fixed at last year's values for a good part of this okay, year. Yeah, yeah, this isn't my area at all. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I, for, I had for, for and tax, okay, yeah, for just tax question. Yeah. And I'll yield. Um, are we talking real property tax or are we talking personal property tax? I think both are abated under this program. No, right real, just real property. Okay. So so and, and what's the uh what's the assessed value of the parcel now? Yeah. 1.8 something. 1.8, that's the total taxable value for 2022. Wait, taxable uh, value, taxable assessed value, value, true cash value, taxable so, value. What you what you pay taxes so on it's assessed at. AV, AV is yes. 1.8. The current, okay. And that's for tax year. The current state equalized value for 2022 is $1,962,200. $1, that includes land building and land improvements. That's SEV. That's SEV. And is that the same as what it's taxed at? Or no. is that a different value? Taxable value is $1,000,000. Eight hundred twenty-three thousand nine hundred and ten. So one point eight TV. Right, and that's um, land, land improvements, and building. But the PA two hundred and ten is only for the building value. Okay. It does not include the land or the land improvements. So land, building, fixtures, improvements. Right. Okay. And that value for twenty twenty two is eight hundred seventy-five thousand four hundred seventy-seven. For is that building, building portion of the taxable value? So we're talking about a million dollars is the base on which the, this tax or the relief would apply. Round numbers, April. That would be the base number. Okay, so that's the number that would go on the application. What, what's the current value of personality based on the photos? Not much, right? There is no personal property in the building. I mean, that's what it looked like. But yeah, could be nothing there. And would the Personal property taxes be borne by this entity seeking relief or the component uh, uh, tenants who, who buy things to do their work? I What's the scope of the relief? The business personal property traditionally is on the business, the guy going into that particular suite or store or whatever. I believe that portion would still be okay if they brought in their own computer, their own microscope, their own whatever. You say it would be okay. But, but that mean subject but to tax at a full property. rate or subject to some sort of relief? No, that, port, 
that personal. portion wouldn't the personal property to if I went into Mark space and said, Hey, I want 5,000 square feet to do my thing. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but the office furniture, the computers, the machine, so, piece of machine, that so portion. If he's successful, people are going to come in and they're going to buy equipment and they're going to buy a lot of things that don't become a uh, realty, but their township will recover the taxes on that question mark. I believe the brownfield was tied into the personal property. And when you say the brownfield, what that would not include Joe Tennant going over there and leasing a space in his up uh, and if he brings in his own office furniture, correct? Yeah. So or, so two things, right? Uh -huh. uh, the PA 210 would have made real property only, right? Not personal property. And to the extent that there's increment from real property, the brownfield could tip that. The personal property on the site is also eligible for reimbursement. So, that, so that's one of, one of my big questions, what I should ask first, we're talking about two potential avenues for relief, correct? We're talking about a TIF capturing the increase in taxes that, that occurs naturally. And, and, and that goes, is that, that's one of the forms, a TIF, right? And that doesn't get you to where you need to be to do your project, it sounds like. Is that correct? Correct. And, and, and is the TIF on the increment that happens naturally as property values increase or does the TIF also go to the acquisition of personal property on which taxation occurs you know, by the township? So both real property taxes and personal property taxes can be captured for reimbursement of brownfield eligible activity costs. And is a township able to say, we'll grant relief with respect to one, one but not the other? The, yeah, the, the township can make that distinction and limit reimbursement to be, um, so a brownfield plan can include personal property or not include personal property, incremental taxes there. So you're talking a chip. And then the other form of relief is just old school abate. Right. And so they overlap, right? So the abatement would be up to a 10 year abatement. If you think of, you know, the taxes increasing through Mark's investment on real property taxes, there is a piece of that that's state school taxes. And there's right. a piece of that. Three or four questions down the road for me. Okay. And there's a piece, the other piece of that is non non school taxes. So your township, county taxes, those sorts of things. The PA two ten doesn't operate on the school taxes. It only operates on the non school, and so it would abate those for ten years, which limits the the real property taxes. The school tax portion, which is not limited by the PA two ten during that period of time largely could be utilized for reimbursement of brownfield eligible activity costs. So, so you're, we collect, will this apply to both winter tax yes. and summer tax? Yes. And we collect winter and summer taxes for ourselves as well for other people, our libraries and schools and what have you, correct? No, no. no. we don't collect for the township in the summer. Oh, but I'm, my point is over these two taxes, there are several entities for whom we collect taxes Correct. and for whom this could have impact what? to some extent. To, to most of these, then, I think well, we, we keep very little of our taxes. I'm sorry? It, I mean, I think I think most of the impact would be on the other entities, right, Donna? Yeah, so the, the brownfield yeah. in terms of, I'm Everybody. sorry. Did I, I no, I didn't say anything. Okay. No, no, so, so I know I, and I'm not trying to pit one the school against the township or anything like that. I'm just trying to, yeah, just trying to think, figure out what the hell I might be doing here. Yeah, <laughs> I think it, so I, I, Nathan alluded to this a little bit. One of the sort of advantages of utilizing a brownfield TIF is that you can't really pick and choose taxing jurisdictions. If the brownfield plan is approved locally and at the state. Proportionately, all of those taxing jurisdictions, whether they be county, township, library, what have you, are all utilized for reimbursement with the exception of voted mill and debt millages, which are not statutorily eligible. And that's usually just you know, a very small portion of, of the annual tax bill. So of the pie chart for what is needed to make this work, yeah. 
what percentage, and I guess Mark, if I don't know your last name, I apologize. Smith. Mark Smith, I'll mm -hmm. uh, So Mark, the pie chart of what you need this for, how much you anticipate the ask being, to the extent you have a specific ask, for TIF or the recapture, and how much for pure old school abatement? My total, uh, he's got a chart here that he can show you uh, of what the ask is based on our estimates of construction. All right, and, right. Yeah, well, and, and what's the component breakdown? Two, uh, well, the total is 2.4, and, and Brett can give you the breakdown. Yeah, so 2.4 million is the brownfield TIF amount. So that would be of eligible activity costs. So that's like the environmental cleanup, the asbestos abatement, the interior demolition. Those are the brownfield eligible activity costs. Those total approximately um, $2.4 million. And the tax abatement, um, I would estimate at about a million dollars over 10 years. So that is $100,000 a year or a million a year? Over 10 years, he said. 100,000. Million cumulative. Just want to make so it is the 2.4 over what period? So it, it'll depend. We're still trying to figure out exactly all these taxes. We're talking about the real property taxes, the extent of personal property that's that's eligible. Our current estimates are showing about 20 years total to reimburse the 2.4 million, and that would be concurrent with the 10 years on the tax abatement. So I, mean, this, I don't even know what I don't know on this. Well, well, I appreciate was, the presentation. Well, I was going to say, we didn't want over what we have, like as part of the Brownfield plan, you have to do a series of spreadsheets. I mean, if you want to open it up, you can show. I mean, we're, yeah. we're working on those. We don't have final numbers. We didn't. We were afraid to show it because it would. That we don't want them to appear final, but those are the numbers that you're working at and well, anything requires for his plan. Time, but, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. When you were talking about a captured fund, who? Um, and these two programs, are the schools accepted like they are in an IFT? We cannot capture school operating. We cannot capture ISD. We're not allowed to. So the so can we do it in this? Or yes. No? So for example, you know Nathan had spoken to the Act Three Eighty One work plans and getting state approval. Um, and that state approval is for reimbursement of brownfield eligible activity costs through school operating tax and state education tax. And so, you know, there, there's the schools are held harmless. It, it doesn't affect the school funding, but uh, it does reduce the burden to the local taxing jurisdictions because those school tax revenues can be used to um, reimburse some of that 2.4 million. And that was one of the sort of um, kind of bases behind the working with the PA 210 is that um, it would sort of shunt over more of the ground for the reimbursement to the school tax because um, the abatement doesn't hit the school taxes. Okay. That's okay. We get to the nitty gritty when that town comes. Um, question about timing. There, at some point, there's going to be an ask. Maybe there's already an ask, but I'm telling you, this is an ask that I'm going to need some time to get up to speed on. There's mm -hmm. questions I'm not asking because I don't know what to ask, or I don't know the impact to our budget um, yeah. and, and all that stuff. So um, I'm not as smart as Mark Brazzo, but that's just <laughs> the way it goes. Oh, I'm, yeah. I wonder if, um, and I don't know if, Andrew, I know you just got over into this, but I'm I guess my basic questions are just, you know, and it's always hard to talk about any of these things, but how much money is the township going to lose? Um, what's the impact on the other units? And then, Mark, from you, as best as possible, what, what are the benefits? Um, you know, in terms of, and I know that's tough in terms well, of the number of jobs. Yeah. And stuff. Jobs, commerce, yeah, there are straightforward, straightforward yeah. benefits. One, we're going to take care of that blighted property, which is our front door. That's sure. that's going to be a big plus. We are bringing, you know, we're expecting two to three hundred jobs in the eighty thousand and up range. This is a high tech, new tech uh, companies that we want to foster in our community. Uh, they're coming here to collaborate with other companies. They're coming here to collaborate with the university. 
and uh, we we could see an element of a battery testing lab, which might also collaborate with the university and become uh, a key test lab for the entire nation where it comes to battery and, and EV. Sure. Uh, and then we're also doing things in microfluidics. Uh, so life sciences, we're, we're fostering new technology jobs. This is not your father's old manufacturing kind of belching smokestacks. This is high sure. tech, clean tech, uh, high value. So what would we, what, what could we expect to have? And because and, I know there's so many processes going on, but I'm wondering what level of detail could we expect to have before us before we're asked to make a decision on this? Okay. And not just from you, Mark, but also you, Andrea. Um, and secondly, what are the mechanisms either through the um, commercial program or the, um, I'm sorry, commercial rehab program or Brownfield, what mechanisms do we have to kind of hold an applicant to it to say, check in in five years, we're not getting the economic benefit. What, how can we hold each other accountable? There, I mean, there is, I didn't go over that today, but I can provide you. There are me mechanisms in getting the exemption that you have to do and you and that is part of the criteria to get the, the 210. There's also safety in the fact that we actually present what we've spent against what we've we've asked for and, and those numbers are then adjusted based on the actual spend. Right. So if we've overestimated, we come in lower, which I always want to spend less money if I can. For the brown field. For the brown field, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's not just we're asking for a number and you're going to give us that number. Sure, we sure. actually have to justify that we spent that number. I think I'll have, like John said, I'll have more questions when I get smarter about this. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have some time to answer. We came here to learn what what we need to uh, bone up on and, and share with you what information we need to provide so that we can get to a place where everyone. I'm going to want to know who gets the tax benefit and why. Is it you and to make the deal work? Is it on land? Is it on personality? And is it also the people who are coming in? Why should they get a, a, a break on their taxes if you're giving them this great spot? Well, uh, so so I can, well, I that, can, that's one of the questions I'm going to have. Sure. I can answer part of that. It applies. Up until now, my HQ has taken most of the risk on these investments for the benefit of the tenant. The tenant, the tenant can go to a Spark or MEDC and get other tax abatements, uh, whether it's a payroll tax credit or other programs that are not available to us. So we're taking tremendous risk in the capital side, building out a uh, highly specialized space that we, we do charge, you know, what would be considered above market, but well below market rates for that type of space when you look at it in a, in a regional and national sense. Well, why should they get a break on the taxes that they have to pay when they buy things for their well, business? What, what the tax payment would allow us to do is to get the infrastructure in place, allow them to come in and use the space at reasonable rates. Otherwise, you know, we're going to be way above market and it's not going to be just notwithstanding the notwithstanding the potential abatement and TIF recapture you're going to be getting. Well, without the TIF, we would have to obviously adjust our, our rental rates for whatever our costs are. We, we have to, you know. All right. So, so, they're, so they're benefiting from lower rent. No, I have well, not more essentially getting good infrastructure for market rent, market rates. Right. We take some of the, the risk on by putting in that specialized infrastructure that services things like ultra clean rooms and dry rooms and and uh, wafer fab type manufacturers. But you can also incentivize them to come in because they don't have to pay taxes on the property they buy. Well, it's built into their their lease that we we currently run a, a true gross lease, so they're effectively paying the tax through their rental rate. So paying more tax, personal tax or property tax? Pay personal tra tax directly to you. That's that's assessed on them, the, the real that's property tax. I, I'm only talking realty. I'm talking personal only. Because if, if you buy all these million dollar things, yeah. then that's an incentive for us to do the deal with you because we're going to get the tax on the million dollar things that they buy. Right. Does, does that make sense? Yes. I mean, that's... Uh, I don't have any preordained positions on that. Yeah. So can I just simplify the question from my standpoint, what I'm actually doing today? These businesses, when they come into your space to run their business, I would send them a personal property statement. They would be required based on whatever their little area has and send it to us. And then we as a jurisdiction would send out the tax bill 
to them. So when I said when they buy all that office furniture or that widget machine over there to do whatever, that's taxable as personal property and that money stays here and to the or is that a TBD? Well, so our personal property tax revenue could be utilized for reimbursement of brownfield costs. Those wouldn't go back to the tenant. Those would be like the environmental cleanup, the asbestos abatement. So just like real property taxes under a brownfield plan, the personal property taxes could be utilized for the same purpose. I'm going to use could be with TBD. Yep. It could be it could be used to accelerate the payback, which I, would I, I, I appreciate the, 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 the give and take and the possibility. Yep. Yep. So all of those details are part of what's worked out <coughs> in agreement the, the, that you talked about in more detail in the DDA meeting yesterday. Yeah, and, and you know, back to an earlier point, I think there most brownfield sites you typically see an erosion of taxable values over time. They're vacant, you know, there are problems with them. Over time, the taxable value goes down. One of the benefits of the brownfield program and, and tax abatements as well is that that would be stabilized. So it would be no longer further eroded during the term of the brownfield. That base value of taxes that are paid is, regardless of the abatement, regardless of the brownfield TIF, are going to keep going to the taxing jurisdiction. So that's not going to go down anymore. The, the, the benefit to the development comes through utilizing that increment, utilizing the increase in the taxes for the purposes we're talking about here. Um, and so how you do that in terms of you know, specific agreements, there would be a brownfield reimbursement agreement beyond the plan that's a contract that you can, you know, consider if you have, you talk, I think, uh, you know, how, how do we kind of hold, we look five years down the road, are we really getting what we, what we said we would? Well, the brownfield, you only get reimbursed to the extent that you do your cleanup and the extent that you do the abatement. But if you have other considerations like job creation or um, investment, those can be put into um, an agreement for a tax abatement as well. And so there are mechanisms to, you know, if, if there are certain metrics that, that you come up with that are important to the community, then that can be part of the agreement as well. So there really is a lot of local control over how you want to utilize it as a first, at a first level. I mean, I guess I understand there's risk in what you're building, right? It's a very specialized space, but you're a business, right? I mean, I have a business, right? I, we all take risks. So to me, the risk doesn't really matter, right? I mean, that's all businesses. I'm going to argue any restaurant that opens up, especially now, all take tremendous risks. So that part I can't really give you any value for. If I think to Jessica's point, if there is something tangible and measurable where we can get to see an ROI, and if you don't meet those metrics, you lose the whatever abatements there are. As maybe not every five years, we probably put you know uh, leading indicators, right? So what are we going to see in the first twelve months? What you expect in the second, you know, and, and so on. And if you don't meet those, guess what? The abasements now now go away or something like that, or they're diminished or whatever. There's some kind of ratio that the accounting people can figure all out of what that makes sense. That would be fair and reasonable to me because it's just an exchange, right? There's a benefit for us. There's a benefit for you. And also, I think what's hard about, you know, when like a, a, you know, the unit that collects the tax is we're making this determination for all the other things that we do. We're saying, okay, what's the value of not giving that portion to the library or the school? So we need to have a lot of good information in order to justify that. Yeah, and, and as part of the brownfield, it can kind of be extended to the tax abatement. We put together revenue projections. And the main purpose of those revenue projections is really to look at the brownfield reimbursement. But as part of that, we're looking at what does each taxing jurisdiction tax? And then there's a base value for what the current you know, revenue generated by that is. And there's an incremental value for what will be generated. And you can see in, in very specific dollar amounts what the current base values are for each of those taxing jurisdictions and what's at issue here for each of those taxing jurisdictions. Um, and so in terms of the cost benefit, I think it, it helps see what um, dollar amounts are really being talked about for whether it's the library or the township or the county or the state. Do you have a question, Sam? Well, I want to answer Jessica's previous question. Currently, the taxes being paid on this property to the township is in round numbers about $4,200 a year. 
Okay. Okay. The DDA, since this is in the DDA district, the base value on this property to the DDA is in round numbers $4 million. The taxable value currently is 1.8. So the DDA has to guarantee to all of the taxing units at a value of the $4 million. So you're actually getting more in tax revenue on this property through DDA capture than you would if you were just getting the value on the taxable for currently. So, you know, that's not going to change. So the township will always, for the, the lifespan of the DDA, get a minimum of taxable value in taxes based on the $4 million, not the $1.8, which will be the brownfield base value. So the DDA is basically going to be subsidizing this if it goes through, which is why they have to enter into the interlocal agreement with the DDA so that the DDA is not capturing on all of the, the increase of the value. Okay. I appreciate it. If this is too big of an answer, let me know. Thank you for that. It is what, how did we get to the $4 million for the DDA? Because when a TIFA district is, is created, Whatever the value on the properties in that district are on the day the TIFA is created becomes the base. And the TIFA district must guarantee that base. So at the time the DDA was created 30 years ago, it, it was an active site worth $4 million. It's no longer an active site. And, and that's just the real property. We're not even talking about what the personal property that would have been in the DDA base as well. So the, the township's getting a lot more for that property in taxes than it's actually billing out. Thank you. And that will continue. Does anyone say anything for Nathan? Sort of hovering out there? <laughs> Well, thank you very much uh, for coming and presenting. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So just to, so everybody is up to speed on the uh, process. Um, yeah. uh, at some point, the next, this is sort of informal get together today. Um, there would, the first sort of formal process is a public hearing um, uh, in, in which uh, we have to give notice to the property owner and to the, and to the county, uh, and we have to do that with 10 days uh, notice. Unlike many public hearings, there doesn't seem to be a notice for publication in the newspaper. In the second public hearing was mentioned earlier, there is that notice. Um, and, and I say that because if there was interest in having this occur at a meeting in two weeks, uh, we can still meet that deadline, but we have to move quickly to get the notices published. To, to meet the uh, publication deadline for the meeting, this the meeting of this body on the 24th. If we were to do that, that would keep this moving forward. Um, it doesn't, you know, obviously scheduling a public hearing doesn't bind the board to any particular decision, um, but it is a necessary step if this was to move forward as. Um, Martin. And I might add one other thing as well, and that is that there's a public hearing and then uh, at some point thereafter, uh, uh, the township needs to take specific action to create the commercial rehabilitation district. That could happen at the same evening, it could happen some subsequent. But it can't happen without that public hearing. Public first. hearing first, then action by the by the board. So one last question, just to make sure I understand, because I know I stepped in late, so I hate doing that and saying something dumb. Uh, I sometimes say dumb when you want to come in on time. So uh, is is the plan then for you to 
share back with us some type of our measurable ROI. Say, hey, here's a plan I propose. It's going to, you know, we hard milestones in place that are clearly measurable, nothing sure. fuzzy. Yeah. Um, that goes against hard dollars uh, that offsets your the, the, the abatement over X period of time. Is that is that the one? We've got those numbers already in a spreadsheet, <clears throat> and we can define what the time window is. Okay. Oh, fine. So. Um, we're not making any taking any votes. Obviously, this no. is a working session. But uh, is the sense that um, we would proceed with the public hearing and on the twenty fourth, and sort of see where that where the process leads, get more information uh, from them. That just might be a little aggressive on the time frame. I had to push it back in on a month, just because I think everybody just needs to understand a little more. I'd say just make, make the next meeting after that, maybe thirty days, give everybody a little more breathing room. We'd like to ask for as soon as possible because. The township approval is not the only approval we have. You know, also have to go to the county and the state, and those you know are 30, 60, 60, 90. I, what I'd say to you in the meantime, I can see some kind of real hard ROI. Like, hey, yeah. and it's got to be crystal clear, like right? very measurable. So, like anybody can wrap their arms around it, right? <laughs> it's like, okay, if I hit this number, you know, we're good to go. If I don't hit this number, all all abatements are off, right? It's got to be something really. Could that be is that possible to find well, I don't know if it's fair to say if then if you know if, if we're waiting on equipment to come we're, we're gonna we're planning to try to populate the building yet this I understand it's good enforcement yeah. sure and all yeah. kinds of other things I can understand that could occur right but yeah let's put that was some, a, a, an initial proposal you know to be proposal to be marked up do it in word right so we can all mark up and add our comments and everybody I'm sure will have thoughts and ideas but if you, I think if you do that, it might be plausible to get on the thing on, on the next agenda. But I think that's the key document for me, anyways. Yeah. Is just what's the real ROI here to the to, yeah. to side? I I agree, and and Mark can explain what we want the ROI to look like a lot better than I can. But fundamentally, that is my number one question too. Is like how do I how do I know that you know all of these benefits wouldn't occur if we didn't take this step? And how do I know that those benefits are greater than the loss of tax revenue that the units are going to get? Because we have to answer to every other person that comes in here and they have a building, they're going to have a special thing and they're going to put a special restaurant or a special building. You know, well, it, it can go on and on and on. So you've got to have a, a very clear delineation. Well, I'll, I'll we have a distress building. I got it. Yeah. Like I said, the risk, I really don't care. No offense. I don't mean that in a negative way, but I'm a business owner too. I get to get all my risk, right? Uh, as, as every person here does, right? And they sign up for a house or whatever they do, right? So uh, it's got to be just, like I said, very defined that we are getting our, our investment back. We're making an investment in you and this profit for the greater good. Yeah. What's what's our what's our fallback position if that thing doesn't happen, right? So the fallback would be it sits as it is, and or somewhat some variant. Um, we make the investment with you. Yes. What, what's the fallback position if you don't deliver on you know on on on, on your on your promise? Uh, we'll have to find that. The, right. One thing I can say is that there's there are limited properties in the township that sort of meet this criteria. So as far as someone else coming in and, and saying we want to do this over and over and over again, there are just very few properties like this. And, I understand, but I still have to look out for the, my job is looking out for all the rest of the side. So just, just make it as, as long as it's, a, again, I'm looking for just something common sense, not something extreme on either side. I'm like, like, like you know, a business guy, right? But it's got to be fair to the township, right? So give us an investment. Like if you believe in your plan and you believe that you're going to have all these level deliverables and these tenants, okay, then kind of let's have a, 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 a plan that's, that's indicative of that. That doesn't put us at risk. The, bird, the risk should fall back on you rather than fall on us. So it seems that we could proceed with the public hearing on the 24th. The next step, assuming things move forward, would be uh, action by the, the board to create this district. This is my first meeting here, so I don't know all of our protocols, but conceivably, I suppose that could be on the agenda as well. If the public hearing does not generate you know, enough answers or a comfort level on the part of the board, we could uh, Just, not take action on the 24th right. and push it back. But if there is that's a true. sufficient comfort level on the 24th, okay. that's fair enough. we could take action. Right. Yeah, that's so, so I think we, that's fair. So we, we'd be looking for the plan that Mark and uh, Jessica were describing. Um, and um, yeah, if you get the plan early, just so I can look at it and give you some of my initial feedback, kind of what I'm thinking. 
but just uh, it doesn't have to be complicated. Right. Just a, a gen, temporary going well, on. And I would say we didn't do it today, but I could give you a template abatement agreement because there are requirements the state that you have to meet that your abatement could get revoked that address some of your things. And then the community can add to that, but I could write out a template abatement agreement. Yeah, I'm open to that. Obviously we want you to take the building and be successful. We're like, don't, don't get me wrong. I don't want you guys to rock and roll. I just want to make sure things do go sideways. We're not the ones holding the bag. That's all I'm saying. And I, and I would say too, I, and I haven't been directly involved in any of the 300 North Sea discussions over the years. But what I hear is, you know, at one time neighbors were concerned about something undesirable going in there, right? And now what I'm hearing, at least from the few neighbors, is that they're really excited that you're there, right? And 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 I'm excited about that too. Um, I, I haven't heard as much concern about it being vacant. Of course, we want it to be filled. We, you know, we do, but to, to be honest, what I heard more concern about over the years was it being developed into something undesirable, not that the vacancy or writing for waiting for the right um, buyer was so much of a concern in the community. Yeah. I, 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 really the other nice. I, I can speak to that a little bit because um, some of the earlier proposals came to the Planning Commission when I was there, and I, I did hear from neighbors who were concerned about the, the deteriorating status of the of the existing building yeah. um, left vacant. Uh, I think it was particularly troubling the, the, the people who were sort of making their way onto the property to um, try and sort of conduct their uh, own salvage operation, yeah. one, of, one, one of whom died in the process. But I think all of that activity was very troubling to the neighbors as well. Yeah, I think it continues. We, you know, we're trying to head that off, get the building secure and load out the debris that, that was, you know, kind of left behind. Part of the positive reaction that we've heard so far, I think, is because of the nature of what you're proposing, but I think it's also what you're proposing would address some of these concerns that the neighbors have about the building remaining vacant. So well, the only proposal I could remember coming or being discussed, they wanted to build Oh, yeah. Uh, apartments and stuff from line to line with enough room to park. And, you know, no. No, the neighborhood was not happy about that proposal. I think. I like what I hear. These first two steps, I sort of understand as just a preliminary matter of form that you do to start the serious process. Am I correct in that assumption? I mean, the public hearing. It was, that's part of the process. And I, yeah. the one thing I would add for you is one of the reasons why we're propo promote, proposing the commercial rehab is it's just for that building. So we're not taking the whole site and saying, here, you can get payments if you're going to build other stuff. So we thought that was something that the township would appreciate because you're looking to rehab the building as to what it was before versus creating more density or more development. And Andrea, am I correct in remembering that when you do assessments, you assess the building piece and the property piece for the total? Mm -hmm. Okay, so see that, that makes sense. Okay, are there other questions before we wrap up here? If not, then, I'm um, excited. I want, to see, I want to see them live again. If not, then um, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved by Plummer, support by Rizzo. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. We much. are adjourned at uh, quarter to seven tomorrow. We will reconvene for our regular meeting yeah, at yeah. seven o'clock. We've got time for dinner. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and, and um, Mark brought yeah. Yeah. Uh, recording stuff. Oh, this is the right. 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 Oh, this is the right.